Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Teresa Moran, and I'm the director of the Food Studies theme here on campus. And today it's my great honor to have uh, Dr. Rick Jones from the USDA here to talk to us about transgenic plants. There are many connections between Dr. Jones and Ohio University, and uh, Sarah Watt will be introducing him, and uh, she is a professor in environmental and plant biology. Let me also say that uh, Dr. Jones comes to us here through his good friend Austin Babro in the School of Communication Science. So Austin is unable to be with us now, but we want to thank him for uh, bringing, uh, helping us to bring Dr. Jones to campus. So, Sarah. Thank you. So yeah, it's my pleasure to introduce Rick. Um, I've known Rick for, what did we figure out, 25, maybe almost 30 years. I was a grad student at Purdue, and he was a brand new young assistant professor. Um, so he and his family and I knew each other quite a bit at that point. Um, since then, we've both done several things. <laughs> Most importantly today is what Rick has done. Um, so after his stint at Purdue University, he was, he is now, has been since 1998, a research plant pathologist at the USDA ARS in Beltsville, Maryland. Um, he got his bachelor's at University of New York, Stony Brook. He got a master's in plant pathology at Texas A&M University and then got his PhD in plant pathology at the University of California in Berkeley. He's had several accomplishments over the years. I'm not gonna list them all. Several of them were in the bio that you may have seen with this talk, um, but the list is fairly extensive. So I think it's better to have the time to let Rick talk to you guys. Okay, right. thank Please. you. It's good to hear the applause now because there may not be some later. So. Um, I'd like to just introduce where it is that I actually work because a lot of people really aren't necessarily aware that the Department of Agriculture has um, a research facility. So it's the Agricultural Research Service and there are scientists located across the country that are working on agricultural uh, problems. But where I'm located, this is like the research center. There's currently 160 scientists who basically their full day is spent doing research. It's not a teaching facility, it's strictly research. So we like to say we're the agricultural version of the um, National Institute of Health, but we're really tiny compared to them. Um, the spectrum of work that we do there uh, ranges, there are a number of studies on organic farming, sustainability, there's also a lot of projects on genomics and genetic engineering. And it covers everything to do with insects, with plants, and with animals. Um, and it covers, it's right outside of DC, but it's uh, 5,000 pristine acres of agricultural research um, property. And one of the problems there's been with transgenic plants is that there aren't enough scientists going out and speaking about them. They're, they're very comfortable speaking to each other, but they rarely go out into the public to give any presentation. So that's why I enjoy coming to things like this to try to explain what it is that scientists are doing and, and where they're, why they're doing this. So kind of overview of the talk, it's gonna be, first I'm gonna just talk about how agricultural development has occurred over time. Uh, things with genetic engineering, they're new, but they're just part of the long-standing process of development in agriculture. Uh, I'm gonna bring up a few things have to do with where do these ideas come from? Uh, you know, people call some of this stuff Frankenfood, um, but there's actually rational ideas behind what it is that we're doing. And then, um, Towards the end, I'm just gonna highlight a few cases where you are being using genetic engineering products on a, probably on a daily basis. Uh, you may not know that that's where they came from, but that is what is um, uh, being used, and in some cases, the 
sole subject of your maintaining your health. So I start off with reminding people technology is what drives productivity. Doesn't matter if that's a car being made, an iPhone being made. It's also very important in agriculture. Going from the old days of a little farm tractor where you could get maybe 30 acres in a day taken care of today, agricultural engineers have come up with all types of technology to advance the ability to farm on a much larger scale. This is important because back in the old farm tractor days, you may have had, you know, one in 20 Americans were farmers. Today it's way less than 2%. So you have increasing populations being fed by a reduced number of farmers. And a lot of this is because of technology. So you not only have the mechanical technology, you have the crop technology. Um, and this is a picture of what corn originally was. This is a quarter and shows you what the original wild corn was. And then through breeding efforts, uh, they've come up with what today's corn is, a very highly productive plant. So wild plants have been captured and improved over time. And you look at productivity, this is uh, just in potatoes. Most potato breeding happened in the late 20s. So it's the first time you actually had genetic improvement through breeding. And you can see the, the increase in yields that occurred. Some of this requires increased fertilizer, but the overall picture is that you're not farming on any more acres than you used to, and yet you're feeding a population which is expanded from 50 million to 250 million. So the U.S. is unsurpassed in agricultural productivity. It's what keeps the prices of food down. We have lots of food. It's actually a source of exports, which is good for the, for the U.S. Um, economy. <clears throat> but what you have to keep in mind is that even though life is good right now, there's a, still a lot of threats out there to your food production. Uh, this goes way back to the Irish potato famine. This is a mass grave where there was a fungus that came in and killed the potatoes, which was a primary crop in Ireland, and resulted in the death of almost a million Irish. And another million emigrated to the U.S. and became the base of the early Irish ancestry in the United States. Something like this could still happen, and you have to be able to address that potential and have uh, an answer to it. More recent examples, uh, this was a mango field in Puerto Rico, okay, and the, the hurricane came through and basically destroyed all the agricultural production. So what are they going to eat in Puerto Rico? Is they're going to have to rely on imported agricultural products from other parts of the world, hopefully the U.S., since it is the U.S. But these are the unpredictable threats that you have to agricultural um, production. So I give a little history of the idea of commercialization of plants. Uh, this actually started in the early 1900s by this man right here. His uh, name is Luther Burbank, and he used to to breed plants, and then he realized, I can sell these new varieties. And he had a catalog, this is 1913, with some of the varieties that he had bred and selected to improve. And this was the early commercialization. And to show the impact of early plant commercialization is you just look at the two other individuals here. This is a plant breeder. This is Henry Ford, and this is Thomas Edison. So in the day, these were the leaders of what was going to be future technologies in a lot of different um, fields. In the 1920s, 1930s, people realized that you could make what are called hybrids. Um, today our hybrids are often things like labradoodles, where you make a cross between a Labrador and a poodle. That makes an interesting new hybrid dog, but you cannot use you cannot cross two Labradoodles and end up 
with the same thing. So you're always relying on a Labrador and a Poodle. So you end up with what's called hybrid products. What that does mean is that you can't use the seed from that plant and expect to get the same hybrid. You have to always cross with those two original parents. What this means is that if you save your seed, you will not get the benefit of a hybrid. You have to buy the seed. This was introduced in the 1930s by the Pioneer Hybrid, which became owned by DuPont, which became owned by Dow, became owned by five other companies since then. But what's important here, this is only 1% in the 1930s, but in the 1940s, 80% of U.S. corn production was based on buying hybrid seed corn. And that resulted in a dramatic increase in the production of corn. And this is just an early example of the growers are the ones who make the choices on the seed that they buy. They did not have to buy hybrid seed. They could have still kept their non-hybrid seed, planted it year after year. But an economic decision was made that it's a better investment to buy hybrid corn and grow it because you get a better yield. So this has recurring themes today over when a new genetic engineered product comes out, it's up to the producer to decide is there economic benefit in using this or not. There's no one saying, well, you've got to use this because it's out there, because other options are still available. They're just not chosen. A uh, quick review of plant breeding. Uh, it's basically unnatural selection because you're taking a wild plant. You're selecting for traits that are good for you to have um, as a food product, but it's of no benefit for the plant as far as um, survival and growth is concerned. This is a, just an example of what you can get from natural mutation and selection that occurs in plant breeding. You take a, what used to be a wild mustard, and the offspring that eventually comes through multiple selection and mutation are things like cabbage, kale, and cauliflower. So this is all through selection, breeding, and mutation. Um, these are other examples. This is actually a Luther Burbank uh, blackberry. Had a mutation in it so it couldn't produce the pigment, so it, it turned out to be white. That was a, a big failure because people ate blackberries with cream and they couldn't see the white berries anymore. So, But this was actually the potato that was involved, was grown during the Irish potato famine, and he found a mutation which produced this tuber and it was called the Burbank potato. And then later, a second mutation was found, which led to the russeting, the roughness on the outside. And this today is called russet Burbank. And it was introduced in uh, about 1910. And it still represents 65% of all US potato production today. And breeders have continually released competing potato varieties, but it was the grower's choice that they wanted to retain the russet Burbank potato. And up until recently, this is, they were not choosing that because of genetic engineering. It just had the traits, the qualities. It was something they could grow the way that they wanted to. Again, this is a grower's selection as to what they want to produce. So seasonally, I bring up uh, one of the many examples of natural mutation. When you look at Indian corn, you see all these different colorations in here. If you look closely, you can see additional colorations, see little streaks occurring in there. All of this is occurring because of something called a transposon. And you don't have to know the technical part of that, but it's a little piece of DNA that is in the genome of the corn, and it comes out and it hops over to another part of the DNA. So it's basically hopping around inside the genome of the corn. When it does that, a lot of times you can't see it, but you can see it when it interferes with a pathway involved in pigment production. So 
These little transposons are just hopping around in the DNA all of the time. They're believed to originate as being probably a virus at some point. Anyways, it's naturally occurring. It's in plant genomes, and it hops around. So it is causing consistent mutations in the plant DNA. A lot of times you don't see what the mutations are. Uh, they're going to be silent. It's only when it does something that makes the plant get bigger or changes the color that then it becomes visible. This is an example where breeders have taken advantage of what's actually a, its genetic engineering that the plant is doing itself by having a transposon hop around in its DNA. And different transposon hopping is what's resulted in different colors of um, oranges. Things like the blood orange is it's a pigmentation item where the transposon has altered it. And then the breeders will take that and maintain that as um, stock to have so they have blood oranges. But this is all mutations just happening naturally. So DNA is moving around. Um, other ways you get mutations, uh, ultraviolet exposure. I mean, causes mutations actually in your skin cells that can lead to skin cancer. Uh, spontaneous errors where, where you're copying something and you make a typo in it. That can be an error that's maintained or it can be eliminated if it's uh, dangerous to the organism. But there are multiple errors constantly going on. And breeders rely on retaining these mutations, and when they make crosses, they look for new mutations that have occurred during the cross. So to sum all this up, what's important here is that genetic variability does not produce an unsafe food. You have selection of things such as corn, soybeans, potatoes. Those were chosen by ancient humans as they were eating different foods and figuring out what's good and what's going to kill them. That's why today we eat tomatoes, we don't eat nightshade. But again, the genetic variability, whether it's produced naturally or through genetic engineering, there simply has not been a scientific basis for saying that a food crop has become dangerous to eat for any reason. It, basically, these food crops don't have genes that, which would make them toxic. And the genes that are putting in have nothing to do with toxicity. Uh, recombinant DNA, I'm going to mention this a few times just to remind people. This is basically cutting and pasting. So transposons cut and paste as they cut their way out of a piece of DNA, hop over, and paste themselves into another part of DNA. Scientists have just over the years figured out how do you do that and then harness that ability to put the genes that they want moved into different organisms. So basically scientists' purpose is to understand what nature has already made and then engineer it if they want to make some improvement on that. Um, another thing that's important is discovering DNA movement beyond the, the internal movement of a transposon. And what was found along the way is that bacteria live everywhere. They're all over the place, and they like to just give DNA to other bacteria. And they do that through something called a plasmid, just a little piece of DNA. The plasmid transfers that information on the DNA to another bacterium. And along the way, plant pathologists have always, they've looked at diseases, like this is on a, a rose, this big swelling and gall formation. And on things like carrots, you get this weird hairy root look on there. When they figured out what was causing that, they realized, that, again, this is a bacterium that, that's transmitting a piece of DNA to another organism. In this case, it's agrobacterium. And 
agrobacterium takes a little bit of its DNA and transmits it into the cells of the plant. And it has genes on it which encode for plant growth hormones. So that's why you get the swelling, the galls. That's also why you get the sudden root formation occurring. So this is transfer of DNA from a bacterium into a plant which occurs naturally. What scientists have done is said, hey, let's get rid of the gall forming things and put a gene that we want in the plant, put it in agrobacterium, and get agrobacterium to put it into the plant. So this was the early basis for how you transmit genes from one organism to another, is you're using a natural process. You're just inserting the gene that you want in there instead of what gene uh, the agrobacterium had in there. So what's been interesting is uh, obviously you can recognize these are sweet potatoes. These are actually Chinese sweet potatoes. They're huge um, and they're actually used for mostly for animal feed over in China. But we eat sweet potatoes all the time. And it turned out that the um, International Center for Potatoes, they have all the world's potatoes. They also have all the world's sweet potatoes. And it turns out that back in early times when, when humans were digging through the ground to eat a bunch of different roots that they didn't know what they were, but that's how they were getting their food, they came across what would eventually be sweet potato and it had the swollen roots and it was a much better source than the ones that didn't have the swollen roots. What the Potato Institute found out was that the reason that they're swollen is because they have genes from agrobacterium in them that causes the swelling. So basically, sweet potatoes were the first genetically engineered plant out there. And when you're eating a sweet potato, you're eating DNA that came from the bacterium and is incorporated into the sweet potato. So I like to show this matrix because some people think that you know biotechnology is over here and it has nothing that's completely independent of agriculture. But what you have to realize is it's just one of the tools that's being used. But there are obviously additional mechanisms that are used and they're complementary. They help support each other. Uh, but you do have to use multiple tools. If you, um, you can't use just biotechnology all of the time. So uh, just to quickly cover the major targets of genetic engineering. The first one was herbicide tolerance, uh, and then insect resistance, and then finally uh, disease resistance. When you look at worldwide production of gen genetic engineered crops, it's not a question of are we going to use them. It's we have been using them for a long time. Uh, after their introduction in the United States, they, it looks like they plateaued out, but that's because the United States is largely saturated with genetic engineered crops. Where it's increasing now is in developed countries as they begin picking up the technology. And what's important here is that biotechnology has been very supportive of large-scale agriculture. And when you look at things like corn, there's 14 billion bushels of corn produced in the United States. And there's only certain ways you're going to be able to produce that. Um, Seven billion pounds of cotton. And a lot of this is being supported today by the fact that you have biotechnology available that allows for production like that. The two principal engineered uh, targets have been the herbicide resistance, which was actually driven uh, initially by Monsanto that had the herbicide that, that went with that. Um, and then the other one is I'm going to talk about is called BT mediated. It's actually a bacterial origin um, that prevents insect damage. But again, you can see 
uh, very high saturation level, and you can stack traits into a single plant. So you can get a lot of beneficial traits in there. And what's important about this saturation level is that this is what the growers chose. This was no one forced growers to fully accept this, but they all accept it and they accept any new one that, that has come along. So this is a grower decision. This hasn't been, been uh, forced upon anybody. It's simply the growers see the technology, it works, they use it. So with herbicide tolerance, uh, original engineering was for glyphosate. Glyphosate inhibits a plant enzyme, which is also found in some microbes. It's believed to be much safer herbicide because there, there's no mammalian uh, sites of activity. So it's specific for plants. Um, it does a nice job. <clears throat> This does not mean that glyphosate is the only thing that's used. Um, early in production, you can use other herbicides uh, as the crop is growing. But as the crop gets bigger, you can't get in and spray other herbicides, but you can spray Roundup over the top of everything, and the transgenics will be resistant. This also brings in, uh, let me just show you that the overall herbicide use, some people have said, you get, oh, there's so much more herbicide use. When you look at the graphs, they were using as much herbicide in the early 70s as they are today. So there has not really been an increase uh, that much in herbicide. What has happened is uh, you see here in the red, the red represents glyphosate. So you've had a big shift in the herbicide where about 50% of it is glyphosate. But there's still a large percentage that is not, that is um, still being used. But you can also see the graph is going up. Some of this has to do with uh, resistant weed development. This is because glyphosate binds on to an enzyme in the plant. And so the resistant weeds produce more of the enzyme. So the way you get around that is you'd have to spray more glyphosate to do the one-to-one -one ratio there. So that's part of the reason you're actually seeing a bit of a shift of now away from glyphosate is there are crops being engineered with alternative herbicide resistance. But this gets into the management profile of any agricultural production. You don't use the same thing all the time or you're going to develop resistance. I mean, that's just a common agricultural practice which growers have to fully understand as opposed to uh, just continuing to use the same thing all the time. Uh, for insect control, most of the insects that are attacking crops are the little larvae that turn into moths or they're the larvae that turn into beetles. And it's of interest because they're, they can all be targeted by a, a similar product. And the product is uh, called Bacillus thuringiensis. This has been used a long time by organic growers. Um, it's sprayed onto the plants. The larvae eat it. The bacillus goes inside. Part of the bacilli get digested in the stomach, and it uh, basically prevents the larvae from eating anymore. So the larvae die. The bacteria multiplies inside of there and completes it's, it's uh, increased population. This is just a quick history of BT. It's been around a long time. This is what the bacteria look like, and they have little crystals inside of them, which are released at high pH, which is present in insect guts. And we have uh, acidic pH in our stomachs. That's why this is not released in um, humans. Um, this was found back in 1901. A bunch of silkworms were dying in Japan, and that's when they first isolated this bacteria. When they found flower moths were dying, found the same thing. It took quite a few years before they figured out what was going on. And then in 1958, they decided this would actually be a good insecticide. 
Um, so it, it began marketing in the US. And now there's actually hundreds of different isolates, hundreds of different crystalline forms, and they all have different specificities to them. And this is the basis of what's being used today to alternate to avoid resistance, is you have multiple choices. So it's like not using the same antibiotic all the time, but shifting to different ones to avoid uh, developing resistance. And BT corn came out in 1995, so, so it's been around for, for a very long time now. So there's a saturation of, of BT in all the major field crops, but what is happening now is the BT uh, applications are coming down into more food crops. Um, and one example that's being looked at closely is an eggplant project going on in Bangladesh. And we don't think much of eggplant. I mean, we don't, it's pretty rare to eat it here, but it's actually a, uh, in the realm of staple food crops in Bangladesh. And this is a typical Bangladeshi farmer. It has to apply anywhere between 10 to 20 pesticide applications per year to avoid a little borer that bores into the stem and bores into the fruit. So they have to constantly keep the pesticide there to keep the, the little borer from getting in. Once it gets in, you can forget it. You've lost your plant. You've lost your fruit. And you can see we have a lot of safety protection in the United States, but you go to some of these countries, he's walking around spraying insecticide with sandals and a loincloth. So there's absolutely no protection against these insecticides. Uh, this is an example of the fruit borer. When it gets in, it basically destroys the fruit. And what's important here is you could say I could use Bacillus thuringiensis and spray it. But as soon as the borer gets in, you can't expose it to the bacillus anymore. So the gene for the toxic component has been simply put into the genome of the eggplant. So it's expressed inside of the fruit. So if the borer gets in, it, it gets killed as soon as it starts feeding on the plant. This has all been uh, open sourced, and you can save the seed from this. It doesn't, it's not a hybrid situation, so the farmers can save the seed. Uh, so supposedly, there's actually been movement of uh, the seed from uh, Bangladesh into India where it hadn't been approved yet. Um, anyways, the end result is you're getting successful food production. They're actually able to market the BT eggplant for a higher price than regular BT or regular pesticide applied. And that's because this is being perceived uh, equivalent of an organic eggplant in Bangladesh because they know it doesn't have the, the 10 insecticide sprays on it throughout the year. Uh, what it is doing is it's eliminating the insecticide market for eggplant in Bangladesh. And this is ironic because now these are chemical manufacturers who are not happy to have BT here because it's destroying their insecticide market. So this has not been approved in um, India, but it, it's not really that India does not want uh, BT because this is uh, BT cotton. And you can see why in neighboring countries, when they look over the border and they see their neighbor's field and then they see their field. Uh, and that's why 90% of cotton being produced in India is all BT. So it's there, it's just there's different governmental issues going on with using that. Okay, so I'm going to do a quick review on promise and peril here because uh, herbicide promise is uh, you get reduced fuel use with these big tractors. You don't have to run through the fields as often, a lot less labor. What's important with any herbicides is it used to be the way you controlled weeds, you did plowing. Okay? Sometimes it was deep plowing and disking, and that leads to a lot of soil erosion problems. So they came up with what's called no-till, where you use herbicides, kill the weeds, and then you don't do 
the deep plowing and the disking. So you got to balance off and say, do I not want herbicide, but I want soil erosion, or do I not want soil erosion, and I'll accept the herbicides. Um, some of the problems, obviously resistant weeds. These are something that needs to be dealt with in a, more of a management thing, uh, mixing the herbicides that you're using. And with any chemical that you're putting out there, um, there's always the potential for some type of environmental risk to occur. Uh, for BT, what's nice is there's a, a very nice safety profile on this. The control range basically hits all the insects that are feeding on, uh, on your crops. Uh, one of the promises here, too, is there's actually been a very dramatic reduction in soil applied insecticides uh, because corn rootworm has been a major issue in corn production, and the insecticides needed to control that are no longer being applied to the soil because the corn's engineered with BT, which kills the corn rootworm. And um, there's no application. You don't have to go out and keep applying the BT. Uh, the problems here, that you can get off target, and there was a paper uh, a while back on uh, monarch butterfly larvae being affected by the pollen from the corn, which could be an issue, except that milkweed, you rarely find that around a corn field to begin with. And the, the basic difficulty with the study was it was basically force feeding pollen, which these uh, larvae would not normally eat. Um, there's also the problem of resistant insects occurring with overuse of Bt. One of the promises up here is actually um, insect diversity has increased in Bt cornfields because you're not spraying insecticide. So the natural insect population that's not feeding directly on the corn has actually been increasing. Um, this just gets back again to remind you that resistance to any of these things or proper management um, you can see in antibiotics, most of our antibiotics come from microbes that live in the soil. Th these guys try to produce antibiotics to kill off their competitors. The competitors try to come up with resistant mechanisms so they're not being killed off by the antibiotic. So it's just a, an ongoing uh, battle that goes on. But antibiotics, there's resistance in uh, bacteria that infect humans today. And this is largely due to overuse of antibiotics. So cutting back on antibiotics or switching antibiotics is a management tool, whether it happens to be for plants or humans or animals. Um, so talking about disease resistance, uh, basically we're targeting fungi, bacteria, viruses. They're all trying to chew up your plants. And then there's what we call the others. They're the strange microbes that live in like the vascular system of a plant and can't be cultured, but they do kill the plant. Um, one way of doing this, this has been around a long time, is you put a little piece of the viral gene into the plant and that acts as a recognition mechanism. So if the plant ever sees the virus, it destroys the virus. Uh, this was used very successfully in papaya in uh, Hawaii. That's why 90% of the papayas are genetically engineered coming out of Hawaii. This is what happens if you don't engineer them. And one of the benefits of this is the equivalent of the, I don't know, 75% of people that get flu shots. You're actually protecting the 25% that didn't get the flu shots because you've reduced the potential that a virus flu virus is going to be present and you're going to be exposed to it. So these genetically engineered papayas are part of what still allows organic production in parts of Hawaii because you've suppressed the presence of the virus so that the exposure that the organic growers are getting is uh, minimized. Uh, plants have an immune system and they have what are called resistance genes. We've identified a large number of these and can shuttle them around. 
uh, to provide recognition and, and elimination of a pathogen. This is a field plot showing engineered potatoes with a resistance gene surrounded by ones that don't have the resistance gene. And this is late blight field here to show you um, the impact of, in this case, it's just taking a potato gene from one potato, putting it into another one. And you can also get genes from other sources, and that's part of what we'll talk about. There's a disease today, it's called citrus greening, which is, actually causes yellowing in the trees, but the fruit stays small, it's bitter, it's green for a large time. This is an introduced pathogen, and there's no useful resistance available, and there's no practical management tools. And basically, this is going to, uh, without control of this, is going to eliminate citrus production in Florida. So basically, you're, you're reaching a threat by an introduced pathogen that you're no, gonna, no longer going to be able to grow a specific crop in, in the United States. This is being addressed actually by taking a gene from spinach. It's a defense gene that spinach has. You can put that gene into citrus and it will kill the organism that's causing the citrus greening disease. Um, and this is moving ahead very rapidly. It's being funded by a grower group. The growers say, we got to have this or as they say, it's either transgenic orange juice or you're going to drink apple juice because there's, there's no alternatives here. Uh, another area that doesn't get a whole lot of, of uh, review, but it's important because we're looking at future climate change, and this is engineering for abiotic stresses. Uh, we're getting more droughts. We're also getting more flooding. Uh, temperatures are, are going crazy in both directions. Uh, we're engineering the plants to do things like get stimulated root growth so that they can avoid uh, impacts of drought. And we're also modifying plant architecture, going from a vining plant to a low bushy plant, even though it's the same potato plant, just architecturally it changes, becomes less susceptible to drought stress, covers the rows better, so that you have less uh, need for weed control. And these are all genes that exist in potato. They're just being amplified at certain times to modify the potato. Um, so ways that we engineer fruits and vegetables, what's going to be important is this is coming down into uh, consumer use now. I mean, you, you, you can go and buy potatoes in the supermarket that are genetically engineered today. So it's gone from the corn, soybean, cotton realm. Um, it's coming down into consumer marketables. And uh, some of these are, are targeted at uh, consumer nutritional benefits. One of the things, people want a lot of different colored fruits and vegetables because they're good for you. And they also just like the, the color assortment that you can get relative to the days when you could only get one color of each type of fruit or vegetable. So to kind of explain what we're doing when we're engineering things like color changes in a plant is similar to an electrical circuit where you got to have a functioning switch, then you have to have the wires connected along that circuit. If, if the wire is broken along the way, you only get the early parts of the circuit. So anywhere the circuit is broken, that's where uh, the electricity stops. So it's the same thing with the genes that we're working on. This goes back to the citrus we were talking about. These are incomplete circuits where the pathway for the color production has changed. And so you're changing the genetic circuit that is in there. And that was happening naturally with a retrotransposon. So this is an example of what I'd call a carotenoid circuit. Carotenoids are basically vitamin A, and the, this is the color spectrum that you see. And 
These are just basically defects along the way. Yellow becomes orange, becomes red in a normal carotenoid pathway in tomatoes. So if you have a yellow tomato, the circuit has been broken that lets the product move to orange. And if it's orange, the circuit's been broken that lets it go on to red. Um, so this is an example where you basically have a faulty light switch. And I, people may have seen like Cherokee purple tomatoes. They actually have some purple, but why aren't they all purple? What it means is that there are purple genes or things that will produce purple in there. The purple is just called anthocyanins. It's what's in uh, blueberries and any, any type of blue or purple thing. So you know the genes are present in tomato, but for some reason they're just not being turned on. So through engineering, a new light switch was introduced into tomato, actually originated from a snapdragon. But what it allowed you to do is turn the light switch on and it lit up the whole house. So now you have all the genes in the pathway for the purple production are turned on and they're turned on all throughout the tissue. So now you have a completely solid purple tomato, which does not exist um, in any breeding lines. So the only way you get a fully purple tomato, which has anthocyanins in it, which is a health benefit, is through genetic engineering by putting the, putting the switch in. And this is a uh, going to be commercialized principally originally actually for tomato juice. So if you see purple tomato juice in the future, um, that's the origins of it. And this is just an example of three different pathways you can go down for this circuit. We saw the purple tomato, uh, the blue rose which is sold in Japan. Um, it was actually putting in correcting part of the circuit so that you ended up with uh, blue coloration in the rose. And in this case, what they did, the light switch is triggered by a compound that's released by landmines. So it's a nitrogen compound that leaches out of the landmines. When that happens, it turns the light switch on that causes the purple coloration. So you can actually take that plant spread the seeds out in a minefield, and then you will get purple blotches wherever there's a landmine out there. Um, you can also biofortify food using the carotenoids. In this case, the whole circuit had to be installed into uh, the rice, but you end up with what's called golden rice. Um, which is important in countries where the, you have childhood eye uh, defects and potential blindness due to lack of vitamin A. So you have two choices here. One is you can introduce golden rice, which is uh, rice as a staple in these parts of the world. Or you could try to go out and show these people how to grow some exotic thing called a carrot. Uh, but there's a lot of problems with doing that. It's not culturally part of their food. I don't know how to grow a carrot. Maybe the soil isn't good for growing carrots. But in this case, you're, you're targeting a staple food product that you know the people are going to eat. This is a, a case where you have the whole circuit for a carotenoid, but you don't have the, the, the final light bulb, so the light doesn't come on. Um, white cauliflower has all the genes for carotenoid production, but they don't know how to store it, so it gets remetabolized. But the yellow cauliflower has an extra gene that takes the carotenoids and it says, okay, let's bioaccumulate in our tissues. And so we end up with the yellow. That gene was taken from cauliflower, put into potato, and you can then bioaccumulate carotenoids um, in potato because potatoes produce carotenoids, but they don't store them. So now you can store uh, the carotenoids in potatoes. And just to show you that all this really gets back to nature is that these are aphids. There's red ones and there's green ones. 
they get this whole pathway from a fungus. It was a gene transfer from a fungus into an insect occurred by nature. Okay, the reason that they keep these things around is because they're parasitized differently. Oops, sorry about that. Is the green ones have a defect in the pathway after they acquired it. So they're green and but they get attacked by a parasitic wasp. So some of the population remains red, but they're attacked by ladybugs. So the population keeps fluctuating depending on which parasite happens to be attacking the aphids. So both types of modification are maintained. But what's important here is this is going from a fungus to an insect. We didn't engineer that, that's just nature happening. Um, so I'm gonna bring up when you say what is genetically engineered, this is an example of taking a benchy potato. Benchy potato is famous. It's where the original palm frites from Belgium were, are still used today. And um, the nochis from Italy. I thought I turned you off. Okay. They're all benchy potatoes. The problem is Benchy was introduced in 1904. It's an heirloom potato. Tastes really great, but it's very susceptible to pathogens that attack it. It's also a problem because it's sterile. You cannot breed with this potato. And potatoes do produce flowers and little seed berries, which a lot of people don't necessarily know. But a transgene was introduced into Benchy, and it allowed for genetic crosses to be made. And so you then were able to get seed. When the seed was planted, you got all these different color potatoes, which actually indicated because the cross was between a yellow and a pink one, what it meant was that you were complementing the full gene circuit for anthocyanins, which are purple. Now, a lot of these offspring do not have the transgene in them because they segregated away from that. And since you only need the transgene for breeding, you can take the potatoes that don't have the transgene. And the question is, are those transgenic? They went through a transgenic process, but they have no transgene in it. If you, there's no way of finding anything in there that would be a transgene. And this is getting similar to what I'll talk about at the end, which is the CRISPR modified, where you cannot there's not necessarily any transgene involved in this, and you may not be able to even identify it in the plant. Um, and this, these are just some quick examples of cutting the gene circuit in potato. Uh, to get rid of browning in the potato, you cut off something. It's an enzyme that, that causes the browning. Uh, it's important for consumers if you're peeling your potatoes and they turn brown on you. It's more important for like the French fry industry. They cut the potatoes, they treat them with sodium sulfite. People have different allergies to sodium sulfite. With the non-browning, you don't have to do the sodium sulfite treatment anymore. Um, people making fries, when you store potatoes, their starch turns into sugar during storage. If there's too much sugar, that's where you get caramelization. <clears throat> when you're frying them, the fries turn too brown, people don't want don't want that. Uh, anyways, that has been, that mechanism has been shut down so you do not get excess sugar anymore. Third example brings us to Happy Meals in the state of California that have a, a warning label on them because potatoes, when they are fried, produce a compound called acrylamide, which is considered a neurotoxin. Okay? There's no way to get around this until recently where it was, the tuber was engineered so that one of the products needed to make acrylamide was no longer expressed in the potato tuber. So you now have genetically engineered potatoes that don't have uh, the acrylamide in them anymore. And this is my little uh, spectrum slide because this could work the same whether it's genetic engineering or, or organic. People have different spectrums of what they're willing uh, to accept or what they think is 
genetic engineered or what they may think is organic. At uh, one end of the spectrum, you have people only interested in native plants, no breeding at all, or other ones where, okay, it's okay to, to cross something from South America and North America, even though in nature they never would have crossed, but it's okay to, to cross those. <clears throat> then you have an intermediate spectrum where you can, a lot of breeding can be done by very artificial ways of rescuing the little embryos inside a, a seed, doing chemical mutation, protoplast fusion. Or you can work on genetic engineering, but only if it's a, a plant gene that's already in the plant. And then at the far end of the spectrum, it's okay to do genetic engineering as long as it comes from another plant and not something outside, or engineer it and use any available genetic material. So there is a, a spectrum of opinions as to, to what it is that people feel comfortable with. But what's also an issue is things like food allergies. People worry about pesticides and, and that's important. But what's also important are things like food allergies, which seem to be happening on a greater basis. And this is one area where biotech is going to come in and be able to address some of these allergies. As the, the genes responsible for the allergens are identified, they can be eliminated or modified. And when you look on here, people, actually the most common one is uh, shellfish, but there's some people have said that genetic engineering is leading to allergens. Um, and you might, you might think maybe wheat, because you see people with gluten. There's no commercially available genetically engineered wheat. So you can't, whatever's happening with wheat issues has nothing to do with genetic engineering, because it doesn't exist in the wheat. Um, so this is just to show you moving outside of, of plants where genetic engineering comes in. And this is something I called options in food selection. When you're making what are called hard cheeses, the way you do this is you basically use an enzyme that comes from calf stomachs. And you use that to solidify uh, the material for, for making the cheese. And you can buy uh, a nice little bottle of calf stomach enzyme if you want to. But along the way, it's like we know what the gene is. We take the gene, cloned it out of a calf, put it into yeast, and the yeast expresses that enzyme that's equivalent to what the calf was producing. So now you're not killing calves to get this enzyme anymore. So some people don't care. Some people do care. What it's allowing you is an option for when you have a hard cheese to know that if you're a vegetarian, that you're not eating something that, that uh, originated from killing animals. You may be uh, interested in, in pita, something like that. You don't want to eat a cheese that you know a bunch of calves got killed to make some cheese. And then you see ads like this, which are kind of putting out, it's basically f scare tactic information, the, the GMO cheeses. Fact is, 99% of all these cheeses do involve this, and it's because it's a more efficient system. People don't eat veal the way they used to, so the supply of calf stomachs has been reduced quite a bit. But it has multiple problems. One is it refers to a camel gene, it comes from a calf, and it's expressed in a fungus, and you're supposed to be afraid that it's in a fungus. Well, the fungus is the same fungus that is making your beer. So if you're afraid of this fungus, then you shouldn't be drinking beer. Um, the other aspect is you know, stop giving Monsanto your cheese dollars. Monsanto has absolutely nothing to do with this. This is produced by a Danish company and used widely in Europe. And if you remember, Europe says we don't want GMOs, but this I obviously don't consider any type of modified organism because that's what they're using to produce their cheese. So some of those issues with Europe have more to do with protecting their, their agricultural system than they do saying we'll never have anything to do with GMOs. 
And so advertisements with all the little syringes in them, it gets to <clears throat> scientific validity is you have to ask yourself, was this actually a controlled experiment or was this just a one-off thing that somebody grabbed with and ran and, and tried to make it like this was a fact? So in a way, some of these things are probably the early practice in what became fake news. But when you're looking at biology, there's a little bit of interaction because every one of us is different and there may be something where maybe one person has a different reaction to, to some compound. But in general, you look at what the, the majority of individuals, uh, what the response is. And there's, you can take a case and manipulate it in biology. You can't in physics because you can't change gravity. But in biology, you can take, say, a susceptible line of mice that's more prone to produce tumors and force feed it some genetically engineered corn and it will produce tumors, but it probably would have produced tumors regardless of what you gave it. So those become inefficient controls. You can statistically manipulate things, look at it one way or the other, and there's general bias. What you really need to do is you have to look at the overall publication base that's out there and say, is that just a, a one-off publication by somebody who's never actually published before? Or are they speaking, but yet they have no publications and peer review behind them? Uh, so you kind of have to look at the credibility of who it is that's presenting the material. It's also important to remember that scientists really aren't out there doing the frankenfood uh, business. Is whenever a new powerful technique comes along, the scientists actually sit down and think of, well, look what we've got here. What are we going to do with this? This began with recombinant DNA in 1975 when they realized you can move genes around and multiply them. So they had a uh, conference out in California, and most of these people here ended up with Nobel Prizes uh, for the work that they had done. <clears throat> but they wanted to know what, what, how should we limit ourselves here because of the, the power of this technique. And more recently, you've had what's called synthetic biology, where you can actually <coughs> make your own genes, put them together, and make a synthetic microorganism out of that. And again, it came up of, OK, this is a powerful new technique. We, we have guidelines for, for what it is we're going to do. And unfortunately, even today, I mean, there are scientists who work on bioweapons and biowarfare. So there's always going to be some people who go down that path, but it doesn't represent uh, what the majority of what scientists are trying to do. So I'm going to just move into how this stuff impacts you every day. This is an example of flu virus. What happens uh, when you get inoculated or vaccinated with flu virus? Your body produces antibodies. These are like the, the hunting dog that points and says, that's there. So it's saying there's a virus. And then it's the hunter is another type of cell, which actually then would kill off the virus or whatever was being pointed at. Most uh, of the new cancer therapies today are all antibodies. And if you see any drug that ends in MAB, that's monoclonal antibody. So the old um, concept of chemotherapy used to be chemicals, and now a lot of it is natural uh, genetics using antibodies. So they're basically the hunter dog that is pointing out the cancer cell to be destroyed. Most of these uh, <clears throat> antibodies originate from mice. They're, they're inoculated, and then you clone the genes out of the spleen of the mouse, and you keep it in cell culture. It's an expensive thing. It's what leads to very high prices uh, for these cancer, cancer therapies. But it turns out you can produce the antibody as a, a protein in plants. And it has a catchy little name called plantibodies. Um, this is commercial production. They actually are grown in greenhouses. And then there's large extraction units 
that isolate the antibody. And if uh, people recall the Ebola virus when that came out, and there were a couple doctors who came back to the U.S. who were infected with Ebola, they were treated with a plantibody uh, called ZMAP. Uh, engineered medicine, insulin. This is how you used to get insulin. Took about uh, two tons of pig livers to get eight ounces of insulin. Uh, Eli Lilly's the one that used to purify all that. A lot of issues with that. First, the, the extraction was difficult, a potential contamination. And today, you know, you have a diversity of ethnicities and religions and stuff. Some people do not want anything to do with pork. But if you're a diabetic, what are your choices? You've got to use a pork product uh, to maintain your health. And so actually quite a long time ago, a, a human gene for insulin was cloned, put into, can be put into yeast or bacteria, and it's expressed like a little factory, and it's called humulin. And when you look at all of these, it says recombinant DNA origin. So this insulin has been around, has completely replaced that, introduced 35 years ago. So anybody who's taking humulin or knows somebody who's taken humulin has been taking a recombinant uh, product for a long time. <clears throat> More recently, uh, epigen came out. It's erythropoietin. It stimulates red blood cells. This is uh, important for kidney dialysis patients. Um, it also was used by Lance Armstrong for his doping because um, it stimulates the red blood cells, but it's a recombinant uh, mechanism. Engineered vaccines uh, used to be grew them in monkey cell cultures and then killed it with formaldehyde and then injected it into you. That's where some of the early vaccine problems uh, come from. Today, an increasing number of vaccines are engineered. Uh, hepatitis B is an engineered, Gardasil, recombinant, uh, shingles vaccine, recombinant. And now more recently is the uh, influenza virus. It's actually normally you inject fertilized eggs and the virus grows inside and then you purify the virus and then you kill it and you inject it into people. It's a big labor intensive way uh, the virus can mutate do a lot of different things. Biggest issue here is where all these eggs are being inoculated, and it happened to be Puerto Rico. So suddenly, we're largely out of flu vaccine, except there is a recombinant one called flu block. And so this is going to be the principal vaccine being used this year. So what it shows you is that you think there's no threats out there to food production or medicine, but there are, and you need to have answers available. So then I'm getting close to the end here. So CRISPR, this just shows you that CRISPR is just an uh, acronym for a really long <clears throat> explanation of what's going on here. CRISPR is a bacterial immune system. This is a bacterial cell and these little alien looking things, these are viruses that are attacking the bacteria. Viruses are always attacking bacteria Bacteria are coming up with ways of preventing being attacked. So when you get an attack by the virus, the bacteria basically like takes its cell phone and puts in the number of that virus so that the next time it gets attacked by the virus, it already knows that it's there and it initiates a defense response. And the defense response is to chop up the virus. So that recognition mechanism is the CRISPR, so it recognizes pieces of DNA that originated from a virus. And the CAS is just the enzyme associated with that. And this is a very long history. It started in 1992. Scientists found repeated sequences in the genome of bacteria, didn't know what that meant. A lot of people said, yeah, who, who cares about that? Eventually, in 2006, it was identified it's a bacterial defense. And 2012, someone said, hey, that thing edits genomes. So why don't we use that to edit genomes?
genomes and other organisms. And that is what generated the gene editing concept. This system not only can introduce genes, but it can also delete genes, can delete individual bases in, in there. So this is becoming probably the most powerful new tool. It's going to replace a lot of the other recombinant. But what's interesting is this leaves no footprint behind. So if you're deleting a gene or part of a gene, once it's done, there's no other genetic footprint, so you could not tell if that plant had been modified by CRISPR. Um, probably the best example recently in medicine is that they took uh, and added a gene to basically the hunter cell. They basically took the dog and, f and fused it to the hunter and aimed it at cancer cells. And so this has allowed uh, recently treatment of uh, some children where you engineered these cells using CRISPR introduce them back into the child, and it uh, basically killed all of the leukemia cells. So, you know, in agriculture, you don't have anything as dramatic as what you get with cancer, but we are expecting uh, pretty dramatic shifts in what we can do in agriculture using the CRISPR system. Uh, so, if you have any questions, I'm available. Um, so with the uh, bare keratin production that you showed with uh, in cauliflowers and potatoes, is the production in potatoes and the like, accumulation of bare beta keratin, is that comparable to like new strength golden rice? Or is it just was it just on the show that like potatoes could retain? Uh, the golden rice they had to put all the genes in because rice doesn't produce carotenoids. But in potato, potato produces carotenoids, just not very much. The best they've ever gotten has been like Yukon gold. Um, so in this case, they know that the production is there, but the storage part is not there. So, so in that case, it was a storage issue as opposed to um, putting the whole circuitry in. So you could take. I don't, Things like spinach probably don't have carotenoids in them. Um, you could put the whole pathway into spinach and biofortify spinach to have some extra uh, benefit to it. You said there are some potatoes already that are approved for marketing in the United States. Mm -hmm. but I was curious, do you know what traits they have in them? They have the, um, the uh, bruising, the acrylamide, late blight resistance, and um, the starch conversion. So it's a stack trade. It's four of them all in russet Burbank, which is what the growers want. So now you've just increased their interest in that. This is a, that's all being developed uh, by J.R. Simplot, which is uh, probably the biggest potato producer. So, but the... Uh, <laughs> No, it's in the grocery stores. If you find a bag called white russet, that's a genetically engineered one. Because it was uh, gene edited in a, uh, through silencing, so it was a different mechanism than, than adding new genes to it. So um, it went through the regulatory process a lot quicker. So it, it, it wasn't an issue of, oh, what's this gene potentially going to do in the plant? It was getting rid of a pre-existing gene. So yeah, it's, uh, it's available. It should be a green bag that, uh, and says white russet on it. And if you peel the potato, it's, it's, the non-browning is the same concept as the Arctic apple, which is also a non-browning. It's the same enzyme. It's actually been known a long time. Uh, at some point, you may reach a type of genetic load where the normal growth of the plant might be suppressed because it's doing so many other things. But I don't think 
anyone's found a case where that's happened yet, but you could see that happening if you if you put in too many genes, but I guess that's still a long ways away. Uh, but some of the question here becomes, if you get into something like the CRISPR generation and you can come up with ways of no longer using any pesticides, insecticides, fungicides, would you then call that an organic potato? Because uh, the original premise of organic was that you were not using pesticides. And I know within organics there's a spectrum uh, that became obvious recently when some organic growers did not like the fact that hydroponics were being labeled as organic. But organic meant not using pesticides, but some organics felt that only meant if it's grown in the soil uh, and under certain soil stimulating conditions. So again, there's a, a spectrum there in the same way that, that there is with the biotech. But some of the biotech is in fact approaching uh, an organic equivalent if, if you're thinking, do I want pesticides or not? Yeah, GMO labeling that, I mean, if you see like a cigarette pack, it says warning. If you see alcohol bottle, it has a warning. If you put GMO on there, what would you put after that? Because there currently is no, no warning that you could put on that. And I think it's being addressed indirectly is that there's a big effort to label things as non-GMO. So I would say if it had the non-GMO, then then it's okay, but if it doesn't, then you can assume that it is GMO. Some of that is marketing, and the best example is probably Cheerios. Uh, Cheerios has a big non-GMO thing on it. Honey Nut Cheerios is still GMO. Okay, and that, so there's a marketing issue going on there because people don't eat Cheerios as much as they do Honey Nut. So. Uh, try to bring in a, a greater audience by labeling as non-GMO. So I would just let the non-GMOs be labeled as non-GMO, but it's, it is becoming a very narrow. Some of it's getting a little crazy too, like some of the things that would never be GMO are now being labeled as non-GMO. And it's, So at that point you know it's a marketing tool because well that's nonsense, it would never be GMO. It's like, non-GMO computers or something. <laughs> what do you think is the most legitimate criticism that people who are against this technology would have? Mm, I think the, the, maybe the main opposition, I mean, to some degree, it's the concept of production agriculture. I mean, that's been an ongoing thing of, you know, there's 83 million acres out there, and, and do you want to have these big giant farms that are, that are running that? Uh, that might be one thing, but I mean, that again is what keeps our food security. But I have yet, to, I cannot come up with any reason why they would be afraid of the food because of, because of all the natural variation that occurs on and the fact that we've had these crops for such a long time mutating on their own. Um, maybe the herbicide would be an issue. Um, ideally, you would get rid of herbicides, but I don't know how you're going to do that. I can obviously see where you're going to get rid of insecticides and fungicides, um, and you're going to increase nutrients, but I don't see where you're going to get away from the herbicides. Except, I mean, they're trying to do that with a more natural product like the 2,4-D, but that's turning into a mess for other reasons. But yeah, I just have a hard time seeing, based on the facts, I mean, it's hard to find what's wrong with it, so. I mean, I guess the only thing would be the idea of growing a monoculture, but you have that issue even without genetic engineering. But I'd imagine yeah. you could put these genes into multiple cultivars to mm -hmm. get around sure. that monoculture issue that's mm -hmm. a concern. 
I think maybe to a small extent. I mean, it's it's good to have an have a GMO enemy because then it can allow you to market your product if it's non-GMO. But if there's if there's no doubt about GMOs, then then why would you pay extra for for Cheerios that say non-GMO? Uh, that would be probably the closest. That's where I. I don't understand, uh, I just don't see the evidence for the rationale behind the, the scare tactics behind GMOs. And the, again, the cheese is a good example of why would you limit people's ability to have GMO cheese if that's what it is. So, why not? of like the citrus green or you know, going against the citrus greening without having to wait years for the fruit to or the trees to mature to fruiting age. Uh, there's a short term way is you actually use viral vectors um, where you take a, a, a plant virus that is disarmed for dangerous parts that would cause disease but it will still multiply in the plant. And you can put the spinach gene into the virus and let it grow through the plant and produce this spinach gene product. That, that's the short-term way of doing it while they are doing field tests of the, uh, the, the transgenic oranges, which, which take longer. But again, you can't wait forever on these things. But, but yeah, that is a problem with perennial crops. And that's why scientists are always keeping a backlog of ways that you could control things that aren't a problem today. Because they might be a problem tomorrow and, it's, and you can't say, well, go get me something if you don't already have a stack of things that you could do. So. Some growers were more aware of that, like soybean growers and corn growers accepted this very quickly. Potato growers were very slow. Um, in, in taking up some of this technology, but now it's rolling out very quickly. Well, thank you, uh, Rick, for this tremendously informative presentation. Uh, once again,